Hello, everyone, and welcome to the webinar, Teaching Evaluation that Supports Social Justice and Social, Social Change with Veronica Thomas and Ryan Kilmer. My name is Vicki Velasquez, and I'm the Product Marketer at Sage Publishing. Let me begin by introducing you to our speakers today. Veronica Thomas is a professor in the Department of Human Development and Psychoeducational Studies at Howard University. She also serves as the Evaluation and Continuous Improvement Director of the Georgetown Howard University's Center for Clinical Translational Sciences. Her research interests include culturally responsive evaluation, physical and psychological well-being of Black families, with particular emphasis on women and girls, and the academic and professional development of students of color. Ryan Kilmer is Professor of Psychology and Director of the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences Social Aspects of Health Initiative at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte. A community and child clinical psychologist, his work has focused on children and families and using evaluation to refine programs, improve service delivery, and guide system change and local policy and understanding factors influencing the development of children at risk for emotional, behavioral, and or academic difficulties, particularly risk and resilience and youngsters' adjustment to trauma. Dr. Kilmer has partnered with diverse community stakeholders, directing or co-directing with his co-author, Jim Cook, projects that respond to community needs, functioning on collaborative teams, and mentoring early career professionals and students. This one hour webinar will be recorded and archived for future viewing, and we will be sending out a link to view it and to access the slides to all registrants in the coming weeks. If any of you have any problems with audio or viewing mode during the webinar, please use the Q&A box at the right of your screen, and one of our helpful team members will get back to you as soon as possible. At the end of the webinar, we will have some time for Q&A from attendees, so please also use the Q&A box to ask any questions to speakers throughout the webinar. Please also take note of the webinar hashtag, hashtag Sage Talks, and feel free to ask questions or leave comments there too. So I'm gonna kick us off with a quick poll that you should see. Uh, come up on your screen asking you how long you've been teaching evaluation. If you can all just go ahead and please select the most appropriate answer. And you'll see those results pop up on your screen there. So it looks like uh, the majority of people actually been teaching it less than one year, which is interesting. So without further ado, let me go ahead and um, turn this over to Veronica to kick us off today. Thank you. And Veronica, you might still have yourself muted if you want to unmute yourself. And poll is still up. I want to thank you for attending today's talk, and many thanks to the Sage team for their support. I'm really pleased to be here today, especially with so many relatively new uh, evaluation instructors to talk about opportunities and strategies to integrate a social justice orientation throughout your evaluation teaching. As my title suggests, my aim is to get instructors to think about very concrete ways to bring, a social, bring social justice from the margins of their evaluation teaching to the center of discussion of evaluation content. So with this in mind, there are sort of three big things I hope to accomplish with this talk. One is to begin to reframe your thinking and the value placed on integrating social justice, diversity, and 
uh, equity issues within your teaching. And secondly, I will provide some specific pedagogical content and strategies aligned with the social justice orientation that hopefully you can use or adapt in your own uh, evaluation instruction. And sort of the big picture is I hope to stimulate thinking about ways to collectively and over time to seamlessly infuse social justice content throughout all of our evaluation instruction. Okay. Now, so you may say, well, what is a social justice orientation for teaching? For me, it's one that brings up issues that and attends to equity, diversity, and inclusion issues throughout the entire evaluation, throughout the entire teaching and learning process. So really moving towards deliberate actions to integrate social justice oriented content within every topic that you discuss in your evaluation class. So why do, you, do I think this is important? Well, much of our evaluation teaching really focus on methods, and methods are surely important, but methods really are an insufficient skill set that evaluators need to be able to plan and implement a quality evaluation in diverse contexts. Evaluators need to understand context and cultural dimensions and how these dimensions may impact evaluation planning, implementation, and uh, dissemination. So social justice orientation actually contributes to a better understanding of what is being evaluated in part by helping the evaluators attend to certain issues that may otherwise go neglected. And this then in turn help evaluators be able to plan a more quality evaluation. Next slide. Oh, so what happened? So my approach to uh, evaluation instruction, certainly it has changed over the years. And uh, as I have developed as a more social justice and culturally responsive evaluator. So what I hope to do, the end results that I hope is to inspire students to be more critical, more culturally competent and more self-reflective. I also wanna encourage them to challenge unjust assumptions and paradigms that, that can normalize injustices. Paradigms such as the myth of the objectivity and the dominance of the dominant paradigm or the fixed individual versus fixed system. Because ultimately what I hope that these students take away from this is seeing the role of an evaluator, not simply as a judge of merit and worth of a program, but as a change agent by knowing how to better ask the right questions, the right people, and use an array of methodological approaches that are appropriate within uh, various contexts. So in terms of integrating social justice uh, lens in your own evaluation teaching, first I see the need for instructors to reframe their thinking and take action. I see this as the, the big picture and the essential first step. Bringing social justice issues from the margin to the center of your evaluation instruction. Not thinking about social justice as a con as an add-on or a special topic or a special module within your evaluation class, but something that's central to all of what is discussed and done in the in the in the class. So two big things I think instructors can do. One is that of examining and refining the course syllabus. And secondly, embedding social justice, pedagogical content and activities across the, across the course. So first I wanna say something about the syllabus. Why I say this is the first thing, because this is typically the first thing that we provide to students. They get this on day one, and sometimes even before, if you post it on Blackboard or whatever software 
uh, platform that your institution is using. And the syllabus can be a learning tool for students by explicitly letting them know from the first day the value and relevance that you place on social justice issues in your evaluation, teaching, and practice. It sets the tone. So I would argue that uh, it, it's important to re-examine the course and make adjustments in that course syllabus to bring those issues to the forefront. So I want to give an example here, having trouble moving forward. Oops. Okay. I am sorry, I just... I apologize, I'm having it just continues to so I'm gonna this is just an example here of how I revamp my sort of generic course description some years ago to have a more social justice uh, description of the course. This is just the first and last sentence of the course description. And as you can see here, uh, I made sure that it was a very explicit reference to issues related to social justice, equity, and cultural responsiveness. And now I also want to give examples of how you can actually look at each one of your student learning outcomes and embed and reframe those outcomes from a social justice perspective. This again is just uh, represent two examples from my own course that I went back and look at each of the outcomes and I reframed them from a social justice perspective. The next thing that we can do as instructors in terms of thinking about specific content and specific pedagogical activities is to embed social justice concepts throughout. We, and these are just some examples of concepts that are not typically discussed in evaluation classes, but are very important to evaluation and particularly evaluation from a social justice lens. So I just take ethical uh, sensitivity, even though we may talk about ethics and we may talk about the American Evaluation Association ethical principle, oftentimes we don't talk about ethical sensitivity and the importance of our evaluators to be able to notice a potential ethical dimension when it arises in context. So I encourage you to expand the concepts that are covered in the class. Also, and, and, and let me just step back because when I talk about embedding these things in your class, I may be talking about multiple classes. So, so for instance, some of you may be teaching a class on evaluation theory. So this is an example of if you're teaching a, a class on evaluation theory, and certainly you want to teach it from a social justice lens, it's important that you include transformative or social justice oriented theories, paradigms, and frameworks within your discussion. And these are just some examples of some prominent uh, social justice oriented uh, paradigms. Next, I want to talk about expanding the discussion of logic models. In most of our evaluation classes, we discuss logic models. Many of our students as evaluators will be tasked with working with program administrators and other stakeholders in helping them to develop logic models that tell the program story. So, our discussion of logic models in our classes typically focus on traditional linear logic models, like the example that is provided on the screen from a CDC uh, project. While these traditional logic models certainly have value, I encourage you to stretch a bit and include some more culturally responsive logic models that are found in the literature. And I'm 
I want to give you a few examples. This is one example of a more culturally responsive logic model that you can introduce students to. Now, looking at this, while it does have some traditional linear formats that the inputs are on the left side and the short-term, long-term outcomes are on the right side, the graphics that were included in this model really were designed to appeal to the community being served. This particular logic model is a logic model for the Baltimore Responsible Men Project. And so you can see the graphics really are designed to capture uh, the community so that when they see this, uh, it, it really speaks to them. So this is one example uh, of a culturally responsive logic model. A second example I would pose is that, uh, you know, from an indigenous framework, exposing students to, to these types of models because indigenous evaluators actually argue for alternative approaches to traditional logic models because rarely would you see, uh, you know, a depiction of a program story in indigenous uh, in an indigenous evaluation context that is that uses a traditional model they use a lot of cultural symbols whether it's a canoe a fishing net or whatever uh, but this is an example of using the medicine wheel this is what you see here is really a part of a logic model that uses the medicine wheel which is a universal symbol in uh, indigenous practice and what the evaluators did here was map program outcomes, expected outcomes across the four quadrants of the medicine wheel. So in addition, uh, I wanna give a few examples of social justice oriented activities that can be done in your class or adapted in the class. In our book, the Thomas and Campbell book, we provide provide tons of activities, reflect and discuss case studies that can be used uh, in your class. So this is just an example of how uh, you can get students to think about unpack unpacking their biases and then how they can translate that thinking in terms of unpacking biases that they may have in general and how those biases might actually influence how how they as an evaluator or evaluators actually approach a project the second example is actually uh looking at a uh, reflect and discuss where we just give them and again you can adapt this to your own setting that we give them some examples of uh you know an evaluation in a particular context and we ask them to, before thinking about methods issues to think about contextual issues that the evaluator might need to gather information on and things they need to know to help them to conceptualize and plan for a more appropriate evaluation that is culturally responsive this is another example to get them students to think beyond just success indicators, outcome indicators, but to think about the kinds of indicators that may be important to consider when you're thinking about issues of, of, the, of diversity, inclusion, and social justice. What kind of indicators might they consider in this particular context that actually address issues of access, fairness, and opportunities. And I have another example here that I think is important to discuss issues around credibility, uh, credible evidence, what is credible evidence, because something that may be credible in one context, consider credible evidence in one context, might not be credible evidence in another context. So a big part of a social justice orientation is really helping students to identify, define, and operationalize uh, success uh, metrics and indicators in broader ways. Get into to think about what is credible evidence in the particular context that they are working in. And these are just examples that each one of these could be credible evidence in a particular context, but also each one of these could, may not be credible evidence in another context. 
And this is just an example of a small group activity that you could encourage students to brainstorm and think about feasible ways to disseminate evaluation uh, results in ways that are appropriate to the context that uh, and the audience that they are trying to reach. Thinking beyond those traditional ways of a PowerPoint or a traditional um, a written report, but other strategies that can be used with people who traditional evaluation dissemination strategies do not work or have not been effective. And the uh, last example I want to use and encourage you to rely on the literature, rely on actual cases. If you don't have cases from your own practice, this is just a, 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 an example of a case study that we included in the book that provides an example of what these evaluators did and how they actually use their power and privilege to illum illuminate injustices in the evaluation setting. So in conclusion, I would like to say that by including a social justice orientation throughout evaluation instruction, it really can help expand our students' perspectives on how projects can be examined, how stakeholders can be engaged, in more authentic and culturally appropriate ways, how issues can be raised, how questions could be formulated, how methods can be determined, and the appropriate reporting and dissemination strategies that can be used. And ultimately, it is my hope that through a social justice orientation in evaluation instruction, we can actually stimulate students to see how evaluators really have the potential to use their power and privilege to advance a more just and equitable society, even if we're only doing it one project at a time. Thank you. Thank you, Veronica. Uh, Vict uh, Victoria, thank you for the introduction. Um, while I'm the one here today doing the webinar, I certainly want to acknowledge my uh, colleague, regular co-evaluator and close friend, um, Jim Cook, that the ideas that, that I'll talk about today, the methods that I'll be describing, the approach I'll be describing, is really one that we've used together in upwards of two decades in our work with communities. I'm dealing with the same delay in, in slides that uh, Veronica was. There we are. Um, the technology is great when it's on our side. So uh, in transitioning from Veronica's talk, I want to just underscore that there are some, some common threads that we too see evaluation as a means of, of affecting change. It's not just evaluation to know something. Did it work or did it not work? That, that it's always about what went well, what went less well, and how we can use data then to guide change, to improve programs, um, to, to really enhance the potential benefits for those served by the program or more broadly the intended beneficiaries. Our, in addition to that, uh, I would say that our social values, our social justice values, excuse me, shape our approach to evaluation. That the data tell the story, but evaluation is not value-free. And again, it shapes the, our, our broader approach. Our values influence the programs or organizations with which we partner and work. Um, typically, they're organizations that have focused on addressing the needs of populations that are traditionally marginalized, or those that have uh, faced socioeconomic disadvantage, or those that more broadly address issues of, of social justice directly. Our values also shape our approach. We employ, we train, we teach uh, a partnership-based approach to evaluation, one that really focuses on giving voice to providing opportunities for voice, creating contexts in which folks feel uh, empowered to use their voice and share, and, and we respect the expertise of our partners. So in terms of, of our time today, I'm going to provide just a brief overview of some key practices and strategies uh, that we use in terms of developing and sustaining partnerships, talk broadly about a partnership-based approach to evaluation, as well as the skills that we uh, teach and train our students, as well as 
uh, utilize our sense. So we'll start with some basic basic building blocks. Again, just to reiterate that we, we see evaluation as a key mechanism for, for facilitating social change. And what that means is at the time of, of planning evaluation, talking about the very formative steps of an evaluation, we should have as goals, as, as endpoints, in the notion of how are we going to improve programs? How are we going to improve practice? How can we guide resource allocation? How can we contribute to policy efforts? How can we inform organizational change or system change? And in our view, these efforts really are best done in partnership with key stakeholders. So we're, I'm gonna, rather than burying the punchline, I'm gonna lead with the punchline um, here in, in terms of the lead with the lead. Uh, what are the potential benefits of a partnership-based approach? We feel like it's really key that when you, when you develop strong partnerships, you then are working together to ensure um, that quality data are being collected, uh, that, that quality data are being accessed. You have questions that reflect not only what literature might suggest or what our training and background might suggest, but that reflect practice and some real world concerns. Um, you wind up with methods and a broader evaluation that is more contextually and, and culturally sensitive. And then in the end, you have more useful science and more effective practice. Yeah, it's going to skip like three slides, but oh, there we go. Okay, pardon me. So first off, as we talk about a partnership-based approach, who, who are the partners? We tend to think of these, perhaps non-randomly because we're academics and researchers and evaluators, uh, we tend to think of these as involving academics, researchers, and evaluators in partnership with, with varying community stakeholders. That this essentially almost always, right, while these stakeholders can vary across different initiatives or programs or efforts, um, almost always that they'll include program or initiative leadership and staff. Um, it'll often include those who are uh, linked with an organization program or initiative who are charged with, say, implementing an evaluation effort or the data person, something like that. Um, there are also times where you'll see funders play an important role as, as, as partners because they have a stake. They have a stake in ensuring that the program's having beneficial effects and it's being um, operating efficiently, it's operating in a way that's maximizing potential benefit for those it's serving. Other organizations or, or programs that work with the program or initiative um, can be important partners, particularly if they provide support to the agency or to one another, they have shared goals, they may even share clientele. And then the intended beneficiaries of the program are also really key, that, that they offer an uh, extremely valuable perspective uh, and, and they have on some level the highest stake because they're the ones most affected by the degree to which the program is, is operating um, with maximum benefit or not. They're also folks whose voices are often not heard and not recognized in the context of evaluation. So what characterizes a partnership? And this is uh, an oversimplification on some level, but we can talk about some basic practices that facilitate partnerships. We talk regularly with our students, it's all about relationships. So that's a piece that starts, that they're really grounded in, in, in strong relationships, they're grounded in communication, and that's how you foster trust, a direct and open, transparent communication. You, you work to articulate uh, explicitly, what are the common interests here? What are the mutual benefits that, that may be playing out. If it's, for example, real world experience for our students who are on the team um, or, or, or our class, but being able to talk those through, paying good attention and being really intentional about process. And I hope other uh, comments as we go forward will, will underscore that. Importantly, and this isn't always a strength for academics, it's acknowledging what we don't know and, and, and when to, to be quiet and listen. Um, and pairing that with appreciating the expertise, the strengths, the capacity of our partners. They're the ones that are the experts on their program. They're the ones that are experts on their community. They're the ones that are the experts on their organization, their neighborhood, et cetera. And then in terms of an important practice piece, engaging in practices that are consistent with community-based participatory research or CBPR. 
Now, I should note, yeah, I advanced a little too quickly, but I'm going to leave it there for a second because it, um, if we talk about those collaborative steps, those different participatory steps, one one element that people often note is that they take longer, you know, and, and they do. You need to have discussions of, of objectives and goals and priorities and needs and data sources and, and possibilities and what the options might entail. That then they'll be back and forth. There'll be steps and missteps. There'll be a couple steps forward and a step back, and lots of meetings, lots of conversations, and a fair number of emails. So it, there is a time-intensive uh, component to this, but at the end of the day, we see this as really crucial. Uh, again, this is the process piece that matters so much that we see this really as crucial in terms of building uh, the foundation for an evaluation, and then potentially a longer-term partnership. We take some pride in the fact that we have had multi-year partnerships with a good number of organizations, uh, uh, nonprofits, and systems in our broader community, in part because of, of these practices. So just to make sure we're all on the same page, the slide that's up here is, is one popular de definition about, about community-based participatory research. So at, at, at its core, highlighting the notion of it being a collaborative research approach and, and really focusing on participation, participation by those who are affected and, and by the issue that's being studied, and in turn, by the way, that by their the findings and the kinds of uh, implications and such as well. Importantly, you'll note in this definition, the endpoint of action, the endpoint of, of social change. And that's part of why we also really resonate with, with um, this approach. So let's talk about some base uh, CBPR practices. So from the, from the outset, you know, part of the goal is to create a uh, a context that's really centered on collaboration and learning. So again, without getting into great detail on all of these, it's about shared governance of the effort. We're, we're big advocates of partnership management teams where, where you have representation from, from core partners, uh, core stakeholders, and then what plays out at that team level and sometimes in other ways, whether it's smaller committees or smaller teams, but joint decisions regarding the questions of interest, the measures, the methods, essentially that there's there's this joint or dual decision making all through the project, that there's a lot of attention to the discussion jointly of how do we use the research, how do we make sense of the findings, and we're learning from one another. Again, we one of our most uh, recent um, partnerships with us with an early childhood program in our in our local school system, and it was critical for us to, to really work jointly as we talked about some of the evaluation options, some of the data collection methods that were possible, and, and were really respectful of what were their questions, what were some of the contextual limitations, how did we balance the needs of the teachers or the staff more generally, and so, and, and frankly, they know their kids best, and they know, uh, you know, even the best times of day to go in and do classroom observations, things like that. Importantly, there's mutual ownership then of processes and products. Uh, so that's why we've had uh, uh, conference presentations, reports, um, uh, even articles um, that and chapters that have been co-authored with, with uh, community partners. Again, it's documenting the shared, um, the shared investment. While this can, again, be a more time and in in intensive process, it reduces the likelihood that we're seen as outsiders that are coming in to judge to criticize, to be punitive, to put their program at risk, instead of, of um, really trying to say, hmm, can we try to find a way of documenting your good work, the efforts that you're, that you're undertaking? How can we capture what you're doing? And how can we then better understand what's happening and then use the data, use the findings to maximize the impact of the program? So it's less that it's something that's being done to the program, it's less that's, that it's something that's a have to, and it's more collaborative in nature. That enhances the likelihood, by the way, that the, the findings and the recommendations will also get used. So what I hope is clear is that these partnerships are well served when we're, when we're flexible, when we're adaptable, when we listen, uh, when we appreciate some of the challenges in the, in the real world context, when, when we are skilled at being able to, to communicate with a diverse range of, of partners and stakeholders. You know, we can't, we can't rely on some of the jargon 
of, of our disciplines, plural. Um, we can't focus on, um, you know, fancy terms as it relates to, to, to design. And where this also comes into play is around dissemination of, of findings and the potential implications. Um, I mentioned the, the recent partnership, and it was actually a multi-year partnership with the, with the school system in early childhood there. But one of our first, uh, our, our first evaluation effort with them, we wound up with three different products. One that was a two-page uh, document that was, here are the core key take-home findings and the actionable recommendations. And that was one they could post online for public consumption. They also posted, but it was a different target, uh, uh, about an eight to 10 page um, executive summary that was really, again, meant for say school board level um, executives and, and leaders. And then there was the, I don't know now, 166 page uh, broader report that was for the researchers and the analysts and the ones who really, you know, that was best suited for them. We also need to, in the spirit of communication, again, be, be open to discussing concerns and, and being sensitive and responsive if conflict arises. So let's talk about how we draw on this approach uh, in our class and our teams. So in addition to certainly the didactic portions of our classes or even team meetings or trainings, there's a significant applied emphasis in terms of how we do this and a significant field-based component that we really see as critical that students are learning from, with, and within the community. And, and it's not something that they're learning about evaluation, they're, they're doing it. Uh, so in our initial program evaluation course, uh, our students work with partners to help design an evaluation. This typically will involve a focus on building capacity around evaluation and, and even some basic building blocks like that, so, um, or to that end how data can address questions of interest, how data can be used to help them strengthen their programming or services, what they can collect uh, and that in a way that they can use it effectively that will answer questions of interest. So a lot of, uh, a lot of thought, a lot of um, important kind of pre-work comes into play in terms of really identifying what and how as it relates to collecting data, managing data, and use it in a way that meets their needs. We pair our students uh, with organizations or programs that have evaluation needs that are, say, appropriate or aligned with the student's developmental level, and, and, and really try to triage those that are a better fit for students. So in subsequent classes, they'll do more than, than design and this capacity building piece. They'll actually be implementing uh, evaluation, but we feel like this is really a critical step uh, in terms of getting some uh, focused supervision and, and guidance. So again, every student works with a partner to develop uh, a, a design. Um, it, certainly there are needs for a class, but the product must meet the needs of, of our partners. And what we do, it's really a stepwise progression. And, and that's what, we, what I mean here on the slide in terms of just-in-time knowledge, that, that their students are kind of learning enough for each step, that there'll be discussions in class or, or in a practicum or something where they're like, well, I don't really know how to do this. And, you know, kind of walking them through and, and and, and helping them get through each step. And again, they're not doing this in a vacuum. It's not trial by fire. It's with appropriate supervision and discussion in the context of, of the class. And the students play an important role in terms of troubleshooting and follow through and things like that. So we're supporting them in the work with partners and, and really begin with helping them in the work with partners to determine what the partners wanna know uh, and such. But they're, they're the ones on the ground and uh, working with the partners to sort out some of these key questions. And so that's, that's where it really starts. It starts with these key questions. How do we answer questions that are of interest to our partners? Um, and really, again, we approach this as, as working together to develop the questions and to find ways to obtain the answers um, in a way that works. And then how can we use the data uh, to help us better accomplish whatever our collective goals are? So the first question you see up there, what do you need or what do we need to know uh, about the program or the population of interest? So this shapes the scope and the, the broader course of the evaluation. We often need to let our partners know um, what might be possible. So it will regularly occur that the leadership um, of an organization or a program will ask for an evaluation that does X, but then after conversation, after discussion, that it'll become clear that they benefit from X, but also Y and maybe Z too. And so what we really need to do is it's on us to, to ask questions 
to uh, explain options, to really walk our partners through, well, here's what Y and Z might yield. This is what it might buy you relative to X. Here's what would be involved. And, and again, it's talking through those options, the choice points, their implications. And again, it's not a right answer. And the decisions must always be joint and collaborative. So that's an important piece in terms of walking through those questions and what they might yield. Um, that step can also be supported by either the use of, or for some, for some organizations or programs, the development of, or the refinement of a logic model or theory of change and working through. What steps would we need to take in order to obtain answers to our questions of interest? And this is one that also often brings some, some complexity. You know, essentially what are the methods and measures and means of obtaining data? But the key piece here is how do we balance rigor with what's practical? And that, that, that is always going to be a tension or a balance that we have to strike. You know, that there are a lot of programs or public sector systems or nonprofit organizations that can support or for which it would be appropriate to have a randomized clinical trial, right? Or something like that, uh, or randomized control trial, excuse me. So sometimes it's helping them know about what kinds of uh, methods, whether it would be geographic information systems and mapping to, to uh, network analysis, to advocacy related evaluation, what kinds of methods might be used to really speak to the questions that they have. And then the last one is essentially how would obtaining those answers make a difference? And this is a critical, this is what we call the so what question, right? Is it going to yield actionable recommendations if we seek to use data to improve function, to maximize the benefits for those served? Can we get to that so what? Can we get to that action? And, and we really need to, and we, we really um, work with our students to make sure that the evaluations that they are designing and that we're, we are uh, conducting or implementing um, indeed do that. What I'll say just briefly is that, that our students have to then put themselves in the role of the program lead. What, what do they need to know? What would be useful in terms of reporting to their board of directors? Uh, how would you know if you're maximizing the benefit of the program for intended beneficiaries and really having to think through that part? Uh, we have, have said we, we employ these participatory processes. There's this focus on developing capacity. And what this often means is helping the organizations to, to develop some basic data systems, some way of collecting data, some way of managing data, in some cases, some way of using and reporting data, and, and establish ways to facilitate their use, use of this information. Some of our students, uh, this figure is from uh, Kate Hogan and others, uh, from 2017, they published a paper focused on this approach and, and really some ways that in addition to our program evaluation course, um, through some other courses on, uh, on, on practice and on or some related to practicum that, that we work to grow the evaluation capacity and broadly the, the data related capacity of our partners. Um, I'm trying to evaluate this, uh, excuse me, for this slide and it's not going. So I can't do justice to the paper in this short time, but it's just so you have it here. Um, title, the journal itself, the, the set of authors. And it's, uh, I think, a thoughtful piece around um, around this capacity building uh, efforts and the way students can really be involved. So overall, we really support our students in building a relationship with whatever the entity is being evaluated, serving as a critical friend. And, and so that's really, it's grounded in trust, it's grounded in the relationship, but that's the friend that also can ask some of those hard questions. So that's the, the friend that, or who can and really work with you about reflecting, are we doing what we, what we need to be doing and how can we do this uh, uh, better? Um, really, again, helping them identify or, or in some cases providing access to methods that can address questions of interest. And, and then there's this important piece about facilitating voice, the goal of supporting change, the use of evaluation, the use of data to guide improvements. We need to help them in terms of thinking through the ways that the program could have uh, the, well, it can affect the intended beneficiaries as well as have unintended consequences, and, and then think about the actionable recommendations around improvement. Uh, what we found over the years is that this approach really is, is applicable across different settings and contexts. And, and so what we really have worked to do is to be responsive, because timing matters in terms of who has evaluation needs or what entity has evaluation needs. And, and that's why over the years we've done work in everything from, from 
integrated care to public housing to mental health to education to child welfare to early childhood um, so so th that's a piece that we find uh, appealing about this model as well when we think about some logistics uh, there's some important considerations we recognize that we are aided uh, by having been in Charlotte for quite some time we have substantial networks uh, we have uh, there are considerable evaluation needs. And what's happened, for example, my colleague Jim for class, he'll, he uh, has taught our, our program evaluation class for years. Um, he sends out a note each year regarding potential evaluation needs. And then he does some of that triaging in terms of identifying which ones are a better fit for students, which ones might be better in terms of scope. For our team, we are regularly approached for the mouth helps and engaged by professional partners. The poll, at the beginning of, of the webinar was really critical given that there are a fair number of people watching today who are who may be early career evaluators maybe do not have some of the same experience in teaching maybe newer to a community and so what i want to do is take a minute and, and and talk about what are some ways that that we could work towards building those those partnerships if, if we were in that kind of position and it comes down to i'd start and i'd say invest and engage that look for ways to get involved in your community that, that what I think can be really helpful is seeking out opportunities, um, whether it's volunteering or otherwise connecting with nonprofits that have a, a mission you value or programs that work with a population in which you're particularly interested or have a mission you value. So reach out, try to learn about them and what they do and see how you can get involved. It could be sometimes at the committee level, right, an evaluation committee, a policy committee, what plays to your strengths and, and, and then can also help you to need for them. If there are coalitions or initiatives that align with your interests or your expertise or your values, explore how you could get involved, how, how you could contribute. And some of those kind of possibilities will really be behind the scenes. Um, it, again, it could be around evaluation capacity or data systems or, or helping a program or nonprofit work through or refine their logic model or, or theory of change. What's nice is those kinds of those kinds of um, involvements. Uh, you know, you're demonstrating a commitment. You're demonstrating an investment. You're doing some good, uh, but you're also doing it when there's not a contract or a grant that's on the line, and and it really helps you build a relationship and, and connect with an organization. Those relationships can then grow over time. So, in terms of just some concluding thoughts, just as and, and trying to sum up. In general, we're working to to create this context that's focused on learning, a, a culture of learning, of using data, centered on collaboration. And we see this partnership-based approach as one that yields better questions, and yield higher quality data, more contextually grounded, ideally strengthened evaluations, and that we increase the likelihood of our recommendations being translated into action. And for us, that's, that's really a key bottom line. So I appreciate the, uh, the time and the opportunity to share these thoughts with you. Thank you. Thank you, Veronica and Ryan, for that great talk. And you can find out more information on both of their books on sagepub.com. So Veronica's, Veronica's book is Evaluation in Today's World, Respecting Diversity, Improving Quality, and Promoting Usability. And Ryan's book, The Practice of Evaluation, partnership approaches for community change. And I will also be following up with an email to all attendees so you will be able to reach out to me directly for more information. So now we'll spend some time addressing uh, some of the questions from the audience. So please feel free to continue sending them into the question box on the right side of your screen or on Twitter using hashtag Sage Talks. Let me see. The first question we have looks like, I believe this is more for Ryan. How might evaluators and stakeholders investigate specific areas central to the communities they work with? For example, how do we ethically investigate sensitive topics that the communi community may not believe are central components to their problem at hand? Mm. Um, I think that's a really good question. And I think uh, what I would really want to understand, um, so I think, first of all, it's really about engaging the folks who are going to be most impacted. I would want to, if, if there's a group in the community that sees whatever the proposed focus might be as, as not 
central or not relevant, I, I think it's important to have those folks at the table and to really talk through what their questions are, what they see as relevant, and if there are ways that we could um, frame an evaluation that is not only identifying or, or trying to understand these issues that are, and again, it's hard to necessarily do an abstract, uh, but, but not only uh, identify and, and understand the issues that sounds like some stakeholders are bringing to the table, but what they see as essentially a counter argument that we would need to, we would need to be evaluating and trying to address those questions too. It might be a matter of, of shifting the scope so that we're, are we potentially under, trying to understand how to answer this question as well as this question, as well as this question. Um, and so I think it would be, I think it's important to have, uh, if there are voices um, of disagreement, I, mean, I think it's important to have them at the table and to try to work towards some measure of consensus. Can we, can we identify, uh, can we identify an evaluation that will yield answers that are relevant to all? I think what, what you raise is really critical that if we, if we launch into an evaluation and we have a scope or a set of questions that everybody's not on, not on board with, then it's at that, at that end point about doing something, that end point around application, we're going to be really, uh, our, our reach and our impact is going to be limited before we start um, because there's going to be so much potential, potential pushback. So what we would always do, and when we've had instances where folks have said, well, you know, maybe, maybe your data don't speak to what we're doing. How could we better do that? How can we collect data that would be of relevant to the relevance to the question you you see? Or if you see this is not an issue, what do you see as an issue? And how can we get how can we try to obtain that broader perspective? Great, thank you. And a question for Veronica. Um, how do you deal with pushback from some students who feel that using a social justice lens for teaching evaluation is inappropriate? Uh, well, first of all, I would want to try to understand why they think it's inappropriate. Because if they are coming to the class with this focus on methods, and many times our students, the students that I see, they've had their doctoral students, they've had their methods and design class. So they see this as another class, a methods class. So really what I try to get them to understand that evaluation is really, first of all, social programs really is about social change, ameliorating some type of social problem. So therefore evaluations of social programs need to also have that social justice, equity, diversity, inclusion lens to be able to um, illuminate issues that come up and actually provide data that's useful and that's of high quality. So from a methodological perspective, like one of the concepts that I talked about, including that of multicultural validity that Karen Kerhart uh, speaks about. So getting them to think about, well, I understand in your methods class, you talked about validity, uh, you know, from a methodological standpoint of internal and external validity, but you also need to think about multicultural validity and how important it is to make sure that the, the, that the data that we are collecting actually connects to the lived experiences of people in projects. So really, I think it is helping them, first of all, to have a broader view of what evaluate, what social programs are meant to do, what evaluation is meant to do. And that's why I say one of the first things is really looking at the syllabus and sort of embedding those values within the syllabus so that students have an opportunity to review your syllabus prior to coming to class or either on the first day of class so that they have a better perspective of your approach to teaching evaluation. Thank you. And this next question I think applies to both of you. Um, do you have any tips for how to adapt any of your teaching methods and activities to teaching online? Ryan, do you want to start with that one? And then Veronica, you can answer all. Sure. Yes, we've uh, certainly gotten some practice with that in recent months. And 
And what we found is that this is this is still uh, an approach that we can employ online. That we, you know it winds up being certainly not not quite the same. That but but the meetings are via Zoom. Uh, that or or your platform of choice. Yeah, it you lose some of that attunement to the room and the feel in the context of of talking with with folks at a nonprofit or talking with folks from a program. But, but we've still, our, our students have been meeting with partners online. Our students who are on practicum are still doing things online. I'm leading a team uh, that's doing some evaluation uh, related projects. I'll say what, what has become, what is the reality is that it's, it's affected the pacing, um, that it's things have just had to be slower because we've had to really uh, be responsive and sensitive to what else is going on in folks' lives that you know, the executive director, non-random example here, the executive director who has a toddler at home and, and issues around childcare, who uh, the executive director who has two of her five staff who have COVID and their program is situated in a COVID hotspot. Um, so we've, we've really had to, um, I think that's where we've had to navigate some of the, some of the realities. But it, it, the core practices, the core methods, the nature of the discussions, the kinds of things that we try to do uh, it's 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 just happening in a virtual or remote world as opposed to in person, and you know we can we can share so much and do so much electronically. Um, it's harder when it comes in, and like, for example, some organizations are trying to give us a sense of where their data capacity uh, may be, and, and some of that some of it's harder to get a full feel uh, around that. Um, but it's something that we've been able to to navigate. So I hope that helps. Well, I'll just say, uh, I mean, certainly when we started the book, we didn't envision that when it would come out, we would be in this total virtual format. But we are, but what we found is certainly, and, I, and since my talk was specifically on what can be done in the teaching and learning process within the classroom, we found, and I've certainly found, because I've used a number of the case studies, a number of the uh, group activities and reflect and discuss in my virtual classroom. And they work actually quite well. Um, these, uh, as I said earlier, the examples can be used either directly uh, or you can adapt them to your particular context. And you can certainly have group students, depending on the size of your class, you could break them into smaller groups and have them discuss some of the uh, cases and the reflections and then come back to the entire class or sometimes they're just uh, in it's at the individual level that they reflect and then come back and discuss the next class but clearly uh, the kinds of examples that I provide really lends themselves to a face-to-face -face, doing them in a face-to-face a format as well as in a virtual format. I guess if I, I'll piggyback off that um, just for a second to note um, what we have seen from some organizations is a broadening of some of their questions because what they wanted to do, for example, is have a better handle on how their activities uh, within the context of COVID, they, what, what kind of impact they've had. Um, they want to try to capture, you know, especially for some local nonprofits that are say nimble and in the context of the community, they've shifted some of their activities to meet the needs of the community, the residents in their neighborhood. And so what they've asked in, in some cases is, can we, can we broaden aspects of, the, of our questions um, to really capture or account for what's happened in the COVID context? Um, I'll say one piece that the additional piece to this is one of our students, um, he's employed and working with a local organization as he's finishing up his, his dissertation. Uh, but one of the challenges they've seen, for example, is just, um, you know, we always have to deal with real world factors as it relates to methods and recruitment and such. But if, if you were doing a long term pro pro uh, project or evaluation and then COVID hit, for example, he was evaluating uh, a family engagement, uh, essentially approach in the context of a, a bilingual preschool. It, it created some very significant messiness uh, and some limitations in terms of, you know, the the, the nature of engagement shifted from real, you know, in person and face to face to to online. So that again inherently brings with it some methodological challenges. But those are things that we can try to capture. Great, thank you both so much.
And thank you everyone for joining us today and a special thank you to our speakers. In the coming weeks, please be on the lookout for an email that will include a link to the webinar recording. And that is all we have time for today. Again, thank you everyone and have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Gotcha.